We want to thank you again for joining us for a lesson on biblical hermeneutics. I just uh, did an introduction for the folks that are here. I uh, just mentioned that this congregation has really privileged me with the opportunity to continue my education so I, I finished my PhD. And I have a couple more classes I got to finish, this one and two more after this, but I'm recently been working on a class called Advanced Biblical Hermeneutics. And you all know what biblical hermeneutics are, right? No. Well, let me tell you, it is a lot of fun and it's really important. And biblical hermeneutics is something that I do every single time I prepare a lesson for Sunday. And it is something that I think lay people ought to be aware of for the simple reason it's something you need to learn how to apply in your daily Bible readings. Um, this is not the domain of biblical scholars. However, it is true that biblical scholars have more time to spend on it. So, in one sense, you need to depend upon certain biblical scholars, if we trust them, to give us some of the information that helps us understand what the Bible says. Biblical hermeneutics is basically this. If I could define it for you, it is a philosophy of... Interpretation. And you're like, oh, you just read it, right? You just read the Bible and you figure out what it has to say. No, you can't. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there is a 2,000 year gap between us and the people who wrote the Bible. The New Testament, and up to 3,000 years between us and the people who wrote the Old Testament. So I'm just going to say, you're know, like, well, so what? It's just we translate what? Every translation of the Bible is an interpretation where hermeneutics have been done. We have to figure out what these words mean. It is not evident what a word means. Let me give you a good example. In the last 50 years of a word in English that has changed dramatically, Right? I was there for this. You were there too. When we've seen the word gay go from what? Joyful or whatever, how else would we might describe that? Somebody who's happy or joyful or blissful or whatever that might be, to now referring specifically to heterosexual or homosexual males, right? Um, my mom, my mom's name is Gail, by the way, and she kind of bemoans that sometimes. You remember years ago, she's like, oh, it's just, Gail comes from, as a form of the word gay, and she said, it's just so sad, you know, my, the meaning of my name is gone, and blah, 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 I wish we could just go back to what it originally meant. I said, no, you don't want to go back to what the word gay originally meant. She said, what do you mean? It means happy or joyful. No. The original meaning was actually referring to somebody who was a thief, or somebody who was lazy, or a bum. So if you go back to the 1500s and actually read the word gay, for instance, in a Shakespearean play, it does not mean the same thing as it meant in the 1950s. It means something radically different. So this word has, we've seen at least three or four different changes in meaning over the last 500 years of it. So what makes us think we can go all the way back to the Bible and not understand that there's a 2,000 year gap between us and what the Bible has to say? So we have to try to figure out how to overcome that gap. How do we do that? So it's through what we call biblical <coughs> hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, by the way, that word hermeneutics <coughs> can apply to any interpretation of any type of literary document. The Constitution of the United States, we create a hermeneutic for understanding historical documents. Shakespeare, there is a hermeneutic for understanding what Shakespeare says. We also have a biblical hermeneutic to understand how, what the Bible says. Here's the problem. We don't all agree on what's appropriate and how to interpret the Bible. And I'm going to tell you why. We have something that has invaded the church, and this is a literary, you know, a literary, um, literary interpretation 
that is being taught right now in every school in the United States of America and across the world on how to interpret literature. They've created a hermeneutic that is, uh, and I'm going to throw out some really intriguing things, maybe, I hope, postmodern literary interpretation is, is uh, what we call deconstructionist. Okay, there you go. Deconstruction. So, the opposite of construction, it's tearing it apart. What does it mean to do deconstructive literary criticism? What it means is that uh, it, it was, there's a, a uh, French guy by the name of Derrida who, who came up with this theory of deconstructive uh, literary theory that has now infected and invaded biblical theology as well, too, and how we interpret the Bible. But basically what deconstruction means is that we don't like any authority. It's all about me and my interpretation and my opinion. And so we deconstruct literature and take away the authority of the author and the authority of the text. And now meaning, the meaning of any text is whatever you want it to mean. That is the literary theory that is being taught in every single school across the United States and every single school in the world today. Postmodern deconstructionist literary theory. Probably 85% of the classes that students are learning today, uh, they're learning this. Now, you would say, I've never heard this. I'm going to show you. you. You hear it. You want to know how you hear this? When somebody comes up to you and says, my truth, they have been infected by postmodern deconstructionist literary theory. My truth. Isn't there one truth? Isn't truth just truth? You know? But what they're saying is, the only thing that matters is how I perceive truth to be. That's what that is. That's a deconstructionist method of, method of interpretation. So the only truth is what the individual reader puts into the text. Doesn't matter what the author has to say, only what the reader gets out of it. This is what's being taught as modern literary interpretive theory. Guess who's standing up to this? Biblical theologians. However, this postmodern deconstructionist theory has invaded the church as well too. You will have, in biblical theology today, many groups that read the Bible to get out of it what they want to put into it. And so I'm going to tell you who some of these groups are. Uh, you have feminists. I'm not against feminism. But you have feminist theologians who read everything in the Bible that they want to get out of it to support feminist theology. It can be very de deconstructive in one, in one way as well, too. Uh, we have, um, let me see, what else do we have? Oh, Marxist theologies. How can we forget these guys? Uh, Marxist, or, or a, a branch of that would be uh, liberation theology. Maybe you've heard of this. This is really popular in the 60s. Liberation theology, it's kind of there right now, but it's really big in Central and South America. And it was a Marxist reading of the scripture and basically putting Marxist uh, perspectives into the Bible and into the mouth of Jesus. And they were reading the Bible the way they wanted to. Um, che Guevara. You guys remember Che Guevara? He was a liberation theologian. <laughs> well, not a theologian. He was a liberation uh, gun-toting uh, murderer. <laughs> Okay, but liberation theolo theologians justified violence based on the Bible. Okay, um, uh, there are, and you're like, this is crazy. Is it really? In the United States of America, we have capitalistic right wingers who read capitalism and right wing political ideology into the Bible. Right now, today, there's some, not all, 
please be careful what I'm hear, hearing, what I'm saying with this. Many evangelical churches, not all of them, I'm not even sure it's most of them, but a significant majority are all about getting themselves involved and engaged in the right-wing politics of this country. And they really believe that this is God working through capitalism and through right-wing politics. They're imposing their perspective upon the Bible. Um, they're also, in the history of this, this country, we had all sorts, they would never call this a, an interpretive theory, but it was. Racist, bigoted, interpretive theories that honestly believe that black people deserve to be slaves. All of these suffer from the exact same problem. They're imposing their perspective, their dogma, upon the Bible. We have to resist this because I believe, like I said, the big push against this type of deconstructive theology is happening in a lot of church schools, in a lot of seminaries, where we are pushing against this and saying that the Bible and any written document does have, um, does have an authoritative meaning. Okay? And uh, that's a meaning that is not placed in the Bible by us who read it, but by God. So I am just telling you, if you're doing Bible study at, at home, and I want to distinguish two different words for you, okay? Please don't confuse these. Even members of our church, when they go home and they do a Bible study, and they'll say, and we read the Bible, and I'll say, well, this, you know, this is what it means. Well, that's not what it means to me. It does. I mean, it doesn't matter what it means to you. Meaning is something that is governed by who? can't put enough underlines there. Okay? The meaning of the Bible is placed in the Bible by God. There is an authorial intent. It's not about my meaning. So whenever I talk about my meaning, that's not what I get out of it. Don't confuse meaning with application. The meaning of the Bible is what God says the meaning of the Bible is. Not what I say it is. It requires some humility because guess what? I'm wrong. On many occasions. When I read the Bible, even using a biblical hermeneutic where I try to get to what God is trying to say, I can be wrong. That's why we need each other. We need to challenge each other. But it's not about me getting what my meaning in the Bible is. It's about us trying to do better to get to what God's meaning is of the Bible. What you actually are saying when you're talking about meaning should be application. This is how I apply that to my life. Now that is going to be contextually driven. What I mean, this is, depending on your context, you and I, and, and, I, and I will tell you an example, a good example in the Bible of an author of who who contextualized Jesus' words. We see this application actually happening in the biblical authors. So let me use a good example where um, two different authors reported the exact same event, but they have a different application for the exact same words of Jesus. That would be these two guys. Matthew two D's, and Luke. Matthew reports Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. What did Luke hear? Blessed are the poor, period. 
when you read the Gospel of Luke, you can not help but be impressed that Luke meant this literally. The people were financially destitute and impoverished. Luke, obviously, applied this spiritually. Same sermon, same words they heard from Jesus, but they applied it differently. What do you think Jesus would have said about that? Probably he'd say, thank God we have Matthew and Luke, because I meant both. This is what we have to do when we get to hermeneutics. We need to distinguish between the meaning. Who controls the meaning again? God does. Meaning is placed there by the author, and it requires an intense amount of study so that we get closer to it, because again, we are separated by 2,000 years from the writing of these texts. So that will require us to do historical research. You know, there's a great debate that goes on, and depending on when you uh, read it, on, on uh, what, is, what is the eye of the needle. If you might remember, um, Jesus told a parable about it's easier for a rich person to get to the kingdom of, or for, it's easier um, for a camel to get, for through, a camel to get through an eye of a needle than a rich person to get to heaven. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Okay? And uh, there's debate about people saying, well, you know, that's actually, there is a tent, and you've got the tent, and you've got this, and this, this, uh, this is the rope here, and the distance, this would be called the eye of the needle. Um, there's some evidence that that may be true, and they say, well, you know, they didn't really have needles there, except for one problem. We've actually found needles that date back 2,000 years ago. So the materialistic evidence would probably disagree with this. So the, 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 the time is shifting, the thought process is shifting. When Jesus says, I have the needle, he's literally talking about a real needle and not just that little gap between the tent and so forth. Possible, but that opinion is starting to change based on historical uh, study. Does it really matter? Not entirely. This doesn't really... Can you get the same meaning out of that passage, whether it's that gap between the tent and the rope or an actual needle? You're going to get the same meaning out of it. Okay? So some of these types of things, we just, for clarity, we're trying to, to research and research and research. Um, uh, uh, there's... Uh, let me use one, a good example that does make a difference. Pi Ramses. You're like, what the heck is Pi Ramses? Um, city of Ramses. Uh, back in the time of the Old Testament, you had uh, the Jews who were, uh, when they were in captivity in Egypt, were in the city called Pi Ramses. Except for one problem. We could never find Pi Ramses. So it led to a lot of people claiming it's a myth, therefore the Jews were never actually in Egypt. It's just a hi historicism, a story that uh, the Jews told, but they were never actually slaves in Egypt and so forth. And that was based on historical research until, guess what happened? Recently, when I say recently, probably 70 years ago, we actually found Pi Ramses. It actually exists, and slaves actually did reside there back at that time over 3,000 years ago. So just because we don't have evidence doesn't mean that these things aren't true. But we keep searching for the evidence so we can better understand the Bible. So, so we look at historical evidence to be able to support what the words mean and how they were used at that time and, how, you know, and so forth. We use textual evidence. What do I mean by that? Uh, if I were to use a word, I'm going to use a word. Bank. What is the word bank? What's the meaning of the word bank? A couple meanings. What's that? There would be a couple meanings. Oh, you're too smart for me. Okay, so let me use it in a sentence. 
I'm, I'm just warning you, I'm trying to be clever here. Yeah, I guess I okay, I have to go to the bank and get my wallet. Okay. Now so what am I saying? You're going to a building. Am I? Or did well, you leave it by the side of the river? I have to go, okay, this morning, this morning, when we went water skiing, I left my wallet on the bank of the river. Okay. I have to go and get it. Ah, textual, this is textual criticism. This word bank doesn't mean anything until we know the context, or actually what we call the cotext. Uh, when you're talking about literature, it's called cotext. When we're talking about history, the context, it's the same word. It's just a fancy literary word because people who do literary criticism feel like they have to have a different word that, that keeps everybody else in ignorance. It's dumb, okay? But that's the, basically the word that's being used now. The cotext of the word bank depends upon the word surrounding it. And the same thing is true in the Bible. Every single word in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, there's no theological meaning or specialized meaning. They're just words. So we look at a word like salvation, and we hear something about, uh, you know, Jesus and salvation of Jesus. It's just a word. It doesn't mean Jesus and salvation by Jesus. It's just a word. It was a word that was used very commonly in the time of Jesus. So the emperor, in fact, one of the criticisms that Romans had of the Jews, or not, of, of, Jew, of Christians, was they said, why would you call this Jesus the Savior? That is the dumbest thing, because the emperor of Rome has truly saved you. What did they mean by that? They meant that he is actually providing for you the financial resources that you need to live, and he came and defeated the armies that were invading your country. Did Jesus do that? No. So you see, the word Savior is not a theological term. It's just an ordinary term that was used to reference whatever, the Roman Emperor, Jesus, whatever it might be. So we don't know what the word Savior means, unless we understand it in its context, its context. So you could have the exact same word used in two different, three different, four different ways. Matthew uses it differently. James uses it differently. Uh, uh, Hebrews uses it differently. Revelation, Revelation uses it differently. It depends upon, we, we don't understand, you can't just take a look at a word and open up, uh, you know, it used to be very famous, or people like to do what we called word studies. And uh, so they'd say, oh, I'm going to look up every time the word Savior is used in the Bible. And what they do is they read the same meaning into every place where it's used in the Bible and create what we call a theology of it. That's bad. Because what it's doing is it's imposing a wrong understanding of the word Savior upon a passage of Scripture where it may not actually mean the same thing. It depends upon the cotext, how it's used in that particular passage. See how complex this can get? But you have to think through these things. There's also genre issues. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to indicate a bias that might or might not get some of you ticked off. Um, we have to know what the genre is. You know, uh, sarcasm is a genre, okay? So if somebody says, or irony, irony is a genre. So what is irony? Basically, it's saying one thing, but meaning exactly the opposite of what you're saying. You don't interpret irony in the same way that you would narrative. You, you have to understand that you're dealing with irony. There is irony in the Bible. Jesus says some very sarcastic, ironic things. And you could read it very literally you know, literalistically and not understand that he's saying something that means is meant to be taken sarcastically. So genre uh, has an impact. So we have to understand all these things to get to the actual interpretation. Okay, so I've got maybe a few more minutes. Is everybody okay? Do you want to go on a few minutes or should we postpone the rest and come back next week? It's up to you. Keep going. Keep going a few more minutes? Okay. So we mentioned that who is the author again of the Bible? Where do we get uh, meaning? We get meaning. The my Bible's meaning is placed there by God. That is the affirmation that we as Christians make that we believe that when we try to find the meaning of the Bible, it's God's meaning for us. 
we said to you that we now need to, so it's God's meaning, but we need to figure out how to apply it. Um, I think this is part of the hermeneutic too that we have to create. Because what, what good does it do us just to get to God's meaning if it doesn't touch us in some way? So this is the next step, and you will notice I'm very particular about that when I do sermons. I always go through how do we get to the meaning of the text. I try to go verse by verse, or sometimes bring out or highlight some of the history of it. How do we figure out what this text means? And once we figure out what it means and what God is trying to say to us, then we have to apply it. So oftentimes in the sermons, I'll end it with, what does this mean? Or what does it mean? I say what does it mean, but I'm using that wrongly, and I should probably correct that too. What is the application of it in our lives? So I'm going to try to improve on this. It is a good point that I need to. How do we apply this? Application is dependent on context. So you may apply this differently than I do because of your particular context. But we get to application, we argue for application in several different ways. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with, um, we need to start here. You start with the text. Exegesis is the process of, <laughs> of biblical hermeneutics, how we interpret what the scripture says. This always needs to be at the center of every type of application when, that we want to use the Bible. This is the problem with some feminist theologies or liberation theologies or Marxist theologies. They impose their meaning, their understanding of meaning, upon the Bible. This has got to be the beginning point. The exegesis, how we start with interpreting the Bible. Only after we found out what God is trying to tell us through that exegesis do we get to that next circle, what we call theology. This text teaches us something about God. So this thing that we learn about God is what we teach people, okay? God is uh, loving. That's a theology based upon what God has done through Jesus Christ. Okay? So we exegete a passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we exegete that passage. What does that mean? God loves us so much he'd rather die for us than live without us. What's my theology? God is a God of love. Okay, that's theology. Well, we get further out from here. Systematic theology. Ugh. I am my I when I graduate, I will have a PhD in systematic theology. Notice how it's two rungs out from the center. This is where we have to be really careful. I tell people that I am an anti-systematic theology, systematic theologian. And you're like, oh, let me break that down for you. I think people try to systematize and harmonize things in the Bible that are not meant to be harmonized to create these, in other words, system, systematic theology is structuring what the entire Bible says about these things. And there's a real danger in imposing your dogmatic perspectives upon what the Bible says when you get out here, which is why I think less systematic theology, the better. God loves me. Oh, I'm fine if we just say God loves me, you know, because the Bible tells us so and because of what Jesus did. If that's our systematic theology of the Bible, I'm fine ending right there. Okay? Because our systematic theo theo theologians get so structured. A good, let me use a good, good name. Calvin. Oh! Calvin's a jerk. Sorry. I, you know what? I, I respect Calvin. John Calvin was the systematic theologian's hero, every, because he systematized everything. But if you actually read Calvin's systematic theology, it is such a dogmatic imposition on the Bible. Instead of letting the Bible speak, he tells the Bible basically what it should say, because of his dogma. 
And so we, we get out to systematic theology and it can get very, very dangerous. And I know some people say, well, what about Luther? Luther worked here. In between these two. Luther never developed a systematic theology. Never. He was an anti-systematic theo the theology theologian. The person who created Lutheran systematic theology was a guy named Melanchthon. Okay, not Luther. Luther was aghast at this. He and, he and Melanchthon sometimes went like this. Luther felt like this is all we should be talking about. How do we do? How we look at the Bible? What, it, what does this mean? What's the theology we get out of it? He stopped short of creating a systematic theology. Um, so we don't really, as Lutherans, have an overarching systematic theology. Our, our theology is simply uh, a baptismal theology. <laughs> that this is how God has demonstrated his love and how God wants to save us. But then we get another thing, another circle out of here, called apologetics. Um, this gets really wishy-washy. You get so many Christians who participate out here in the apologetics field where they're basically trying to um, explain to you what you should believe about the Bible and what you know and basically how this applies they're going to application and going in very big broad terms about how God applies to the universe and the world and everything and so now notice how far away we're getting from the Bible by the time you get to apologetics there are a lot of these are the most popular Christian writers are Christian apologists because honestly they can say anything they want to about the Bible <laughs> and oftentimes it's true you can do apologetics and you can do it well as long as you start here but a lot of apologists don't start here they start with their opinion and they work their way back into here feminist theology Marxist theologies, racist theologies, right-wing theologies, political theologies, all start with their opinion and work their way back here, and they find out what they want in the Bible. And you can make the Bible say anything you want to, if you start with your opinion. Biblical hermeneutics reminds us that we start with the Bible. And that's where theology starts. Um, I was going to demonstrate how this, you know, quickly how this works, but I know you guys, I'm really stressing you between now and then. But let me just read one or two verses from what we did Sunday to show you how this works. And I'll point to each of these and show you where it goes. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus, right? Uh, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. If you remember, one of the things I said is that uh, we, we, we wanted to study that historically. Samaria and Galilee, if you take a look at his travels, it goes up and down and up and down. So I said on Sunday, it was a windy road that Jesus was taking to Jerusalem. How do we know that? By historical research. So we can kind of get to the meaning of this. That's important. Historical research is important for that. And as he was going to village, ten men who had leprosy met him. Leprosy! That word, as I said to you, doesn't mean the same thing as it meant to us today. When we use the word leprosy, we're talking about a disease that does what? Eats away at the body. That wasn't true of leprosy then. That, was, that type of leprosy was included, but it could have been any type of skin rash or disease or acne. And I would have been a leper in the leper company back when I was 15, 16, right? So how do we know this? By historical research to see how uh, the word leprosy is used, who actually were in these type of leper colonies. This stuff has not been done by me. This stuff has been done by a lot of other folks that are probably smarter than me based on historical research, uh, by, um, um, uh, by actually re re researching the materialistic culture of, these, of, of Israel. But we also then learn what the meaning of the word leprosy is within this context. And so, you know, I'm going to stop there. But ultimately, we get to, once we understand what the passage means, we get to theology. So if you remember, what was my point uh, about this story about the healing? And I think it's kind of placed in there by Luke himself, where Luke talks about 
all ten of these lepers being cleansed, but only one was healed. The theology of this is what? It was the one who was grateful that truly is healed. Everybody received the same physical cleansing of whatever it was that was attacking their flesh. But the only person that the Bible that, that Jesus or that that Luke uses that was healed was the man who came back to say thank you. So this is a theology of gratitude, systematic theology. Well, I'm going to build a systematic theology of healing out of this. Okay, this is where it gets really dangerous. Who does God heal? Why does God heal them? How does healing take place? That requires me using a bunch of other passages of Scripture and tying them all together. But you have to be careful because sometimes we're doing what? Comparing apples and oranges. And this is where it gets dangerous because then I can impose my dogmatic perspective on the entire, on, upon the entirety of the Bible. And maybe what I really need to do is just be happy with what God tells me in this passage and not try to systematize it. Um, apologetics. Uh, well, that would get out to the point where we're... Um, uh, how would an apologist approach that passage? Um, they would, they would probably just be going on about gratitude. Uh, you need to be grateful. They make a law out of gratitude, right? <laughs> this is what apologists do. They tell you what you need to do sometimes. But, uh, and so then they go on and write books about gratitude, and they tie in all these other humanistic or research types of things, and they go on why this was God's intention and why it explains all the psychology of gratitude. That's what an apologist would do. But you notice how far away we got from the Bible, which is, whose word again? It's God's word. It's what God is trying to tell us. All right, I hope this is helpful. It gets so much more complex than this, but I hope this was a, simplest, a simple enough thing that you can understand. And I think that you all can do it. How can I say that? How can you possibly do this at home? You pick up a good book. I will show you, in fact, maybe that's what I'm going to do this week. I will post some resources that you can use that will help you read these passages of scriptures. Uh, commentaries, no. You know, so if you're at home, you're saying, well, I've got a commentary. I've got N.T. Wright's commentaries. N.T. Wright's commentaries are really good commentaries. But a commentary is already a dogmatic interpretation and imposition on the scripture. And that's fine. I don't mind reading it, but you have to read every commentary, no matter who it's written by, with a great deal of skepticism, even if it's mine. Okay? You always read it with a skeptical mind. So there are uh, biblical tools that are written for lay people that help explain how certain words were used in certain contexts, the type of uh, materialistic research that has taken place, archaeology, uh, that's taken place so that we understand this. And, you know, oftentimes they'll just give you a little, some Bibles are written with some of this in here. So you can better understand the Bible. So I'll post some of those things for you. But I have a great deal of trust that ultimately this whole thing Biblical hermeneutics, our understanding of the Bible, is overseen by the Holy Spirit. And so I believe that even if I get it wrong, and even if you get it wrong sometimes, the Holy Spirit's going to continue to guide us. We need to maybe have a little bit more humility, not be so dogmatic, understanding that we're going to be wrong sometimes, but the Holy Spirit is still guiding us and getting us to grind in the right direction. And even when we're wrong, sometimes God can still teach us some things. But that brings up again my last point is that that's why I think we need a spirit of humility when we approach a scripture. It is a challenging task. And so we need to be a little less dogmatic, a little less Calvin, a little more Martin Luther. Let the scripture speak. Let the Holy Spirit guide us and open well up what God wants to tell us. Let's pray. God, I, I just thank you. I, I just get so geeky about this, and there's so much more I'd like to talk. I hope it's been meaningful to those gathered here today. Um, I know it's a challenging topic, but this is so important. How do we approach the Scripture so that we can get to God's Word? This is your Word to us, after all. 
and we need to respect that. And so forgive us, God, when our apologetics, our systematic theologies get imposed upon the meaning of the Scripture. Let's begin with the Word itself. We ask you to transform our lives. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you all for joining us today. And I ask God's blessing to be upon you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank you. Thank you.